there, there are two primary forms of sexual harassment. The first being the more obvious, which is what we call quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, if you commit this sexual favor, you will receive a promotion. Or if you do not commit this sexual favor, you will be fired. Most of us are aware of that type of harassment and there's pretty, very little of that in the office place. Then there's what we call the hostile work environment. A hostile work environment is a lot more subtle. So you walk into the office and you see a centerfold posted in someone's office or on a cubicle wall or in a workshop. Or you overhear sexual jokes that are, are being told every morning by two males uh, within in, in the organization and a female who's uncomfortable listening to those jokes every day. Um, creates more of a hostile situation where there's a level of discomfort and, and, and obviously leads into what we would call a, not so much of a fair workplace. Organizations have different policies and protocols, but in general, when an employee is subject to sexual harassment or any harassment type behavior, the first thing they should do, if in fact they're comfortable, is make the individual aware who is committing the offense that they are uncomfortable with the language or, or the actions that are being taken. But you'll also see in most policies in organizations that they should report it to their manager immediately. And the manager, in turn, should, of course, report it to human resources. In some cases, employees are asked to report to both simultaneously. One of the biggest challenges that organizations face is that this sort of behavior is going unreported, and it starts to deteriorate the culture. So if an organization is able to be made aware in a timely manner, then, of course, they take the appropriate action. They should nip this sort of behavior in the bud and, and um, lead to a better workplace environment. What's most important is that they conduct a thorough investigation immediately. And that would include interviewing not only the accuser, but also the individual who reportedly uh, conducted the behavior. If, if the individual crosses the line, um, discipline can include immediate termination. Now, there should never be immediate termination without some level of investigation or confirmation that in fact the behavior took place, but it is not out of the ordinary for people to lose their jobs over inappropriate behavior. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that's a very interesting question because the, the lines are blurred as to what society accepts versus what the business environment accepts. So let's talk about society first. It's not unusual for an indiv individual to be rewarded um, for lyrics that degrade women. And they may even receive a Grammy or two or three or four for, for such albums or songs or releases. However, in the workplace, that would be unacceptable. Um, and I think most of us are aware of that. It is not unusual to drive into work or, or to plug into your, your device and listen to a radio talk show where, again, we'll focus on women for now because most of the time it's man on woman when, it, when it, it comes to uh, sexual harassment. And you can listen to several jokes that are broadcast um, throughout the airwaves if those jokes would not be appropriate in the workplace at all. Um, billboards, TV commercials, the list goes on and on. So there is, there is a blurred sense between society and the workplace, but what the workplace's responsibility is or management's responsibility is to define those guidelines so that individuals know what is acceptable and what is not at the workplace. So, so most business leaders will tell you if, not, if it's not the most important asset, it's certainly one of the most important assets being their employees. And they know what they have in front of them because they work with them every day. But then when it comes to bringing new talent in from the outside world, we're all pretty sound in asking the right business questions to make sure they know how to get the job done, right? Can they do the job? Will they do the job? But then there's that, that, that other more vague space, which is, are they the right fit for the organization? And if you have an organization with a culture, um, which I hope you do, that is harassment free, or at least you want it to be harassment free, there are ways where you can come up with specific questions that, that help weed out the offenders before they even join your organization. And that, that's one way of, of handling it. 
The other way is once they are part of the organization, most organizations have some level of performance metrics. People's behavior should be measured, right? In some cases through a 360 review, those around you, do they behave not only from a business perspective and attaining their goals, but how do they get there? How, what, what, what level of sensitivity do they have? What level of emotional intelligence do they have? Are they offensive to those around them? Are they, type of, are they the type of person that individuals are comfortable working with? There are ways of measuring that, and if you could bring in the right people and then measure them in an appropriate way, it, it, it would go a very, very long way to, to creating a culture that you desire to have. Yes, absolutely. Cultures change. Unfortunately, they don't change overnight and they don't change just because you want them to change. So standing up in front of a group of 100, 1,000, or 100,000 and saying, here's what we are and here's what we will be starting Monday morning, never works. It changes by, the, where cultures change is yet, yes, you set the parameters, but then leadership leads by example. And leading by example starts at the very, very top, not only with the CEO, but also the superstars of the organization. And in some cases, as, as we've seen on television, the faces of the organization, the faces of a talk show, the face of, of, of a, a government seat. If their behavior exhibits what's, what's wanted most, that usually trickles down. Now, that's the least that they can do. Now, if you go beyond that, there are sophisticated ways of chunking, if you will, your culture into bits and addressing challenges you may have or addressing gaps that need to be addressed to get the culture to where it needs to be. That is an unusual question, but a question that's on every CEO's mind. So most businesses have what we call uh, liability insurance, if you will. And you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to get into the details of it because the, the, the details can get fairly complicated, but in, in, insurances are available to organizations and they can easily, organizations can easily gain access to either a person who can educate them in that space or, or, or the insurance company themselves. Um, however, that's financial protection. That doesn't necessarily protect your brand. And when you have a, a, a serious lawsuit on your hands, and it's known to the public that it's a culture that perhaps was accept, that, that, that accepted inappropriate behavior, it may impact you in many, many other ways, including uh, losing customers. Um, and that is more difficult to protect against. But the number one protection of all is prevention. And the way you help prevent these sort of uh, situations from occurring is through sound training and development. Mm -hmm.